Well, good afternoon and welcome virtually to the Plains. Uh, we have an amazing uh, group of speakers today to shed a little more light than heat on uh, the solar winds uh, hack, uh, what it means, what we know, uh, as well as so, sort of start to weigh in on some of the priorities for the incoming administration. Uh, couldn't ask for a, a better panel than than we've assembled today to include the cyber advisors to the three former uh, to, to the three presidents, President Trump, President Obama, and President Bush. Um, and uh, of course, Chris Inglis, who's a uh, former deputy director of the National Security Agency. Bottom line here is uh, the investigation is ongoing. There's a lot we don't know, but what we do know is pretty disconcerting and pretty damning. And, and what I hope to be able to do is to, to provide some perspective, to provide some important context around uh, what we're seeing today. Uh, and wanted to welcome, uh, welcome everyone uh, catching us uh, today, as well as uh, our viewers across the pond uh, from uh, Eurovision. So let me very briefly introduce uh, our panelists. Uh, first, we have Tom Bossert, who uh, most recently served as the Homeland Security Advisor to President Trump. He also served as Deputy Homeland Security Advisor to President Bush, uh, and dare I say, uh, a longtime friend and colleague, so don't hold that against uh, Tom. Uh, he's currently the President of Trinity Cyber Inc., and uh, uh, incredibly thoughtful uh, on, on all of these issues. Next, we'll hear from Michael Daniel, who uh, served as the Cyber Coordinator and Cyber Advisor to, to President Obama. Uh, Michael Daniel is now uh, CEO of the Cyber Threat Alliance, which brings a, a number of the biggest cybersecurity companies globally to be able to provide information sharing among themselves and, and to translate the nouns into verbs. We've all sp spoken about public-private partnerships. Michael and his, uh, his team is actually making that happen. So um, he came to the, to the White House job from OMB. Uh, and as we all know, follow the money. He uh, he certainly knew where that was and, uh, and and did a phenomenal job there. Next, we're going to hear from Melissa Hathaway, who is uh, no stranger to anyone who's uh, focused uh, on cybersecurity issues, a, a true subject matter expert. Um, she transcended two administrations, the Bush administration and the Obama administration. So in the early days when cyber was still a big issue in, in the discrete communities, but still a nascent issue in terms of uh, the policy communities. Melissa was uh, a true Paul Revere, uh, path, paving the way uh, forward on some of these issues. And last and certainly not least, uh, Chris Inglis, who is no stranger to anyone who uh, uh, it follows any of the national security issues facing our country these days. Um, a retired Air Force officer, Air Force Academy grad, um, and has served in, in numerous pos uh, senior executive positions at the National Security Agency, uh, including uh, most recently in terms of government as deputy director. Um, and, and I have the privilege to serve with Chris as a fellow commissioner on the Cyber Solarium Commission. So couldn't ask for a better group. I, I thought I'd set the table and set the scene with an initial uh, discussion, and we'll go alphabetically at least for uh, round one. So Tom, uh, you're up first. Um, let's provide a little bit of context here. Uh, where would you rack and stack what we do know at this point in terms of uh, solar winds? Uh, um, historically, is this uh, 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 blinking red or is this uh, just another incident? I, I, I dare say it's not just another incident, but I, I don't want to put words in your mouth. So let's kind of put it into, into perspective. Uh, what, what are your thoughts here? And, and uh, uh, I'll turn it over to you. That's the trillion dollar question, Frank. So a um, number of things here in terms of racking and stacking, maybe it's premature. And I think the point here is that this is an ongoing situation and not one that's past tense as, as reported elsewhere, not by this distinguished panel, but if you look at the reporting, it tends to say there was a hack and, and there were things potentially taken or things potentially done on networks. And for me, the first step in framing this accurately is to stress that for some subset of the 18,000 roughly networks that uh, lost, that were compromised in some way by the Orion backdoor, uh, they've got some degree of concern ongoing over whether they've lost network control and network integrity. And so the first thing I would do is say, 
Uh, analogies poison most of our field, as we all know. Uh, but because we've heard so much about is this cyber Pearl Harbor, I want to just offer a thought. The planes are circling the, the harbor. And, and the, the point here is if all they do is take pictures and return home and complete a spying mission, then I think we'll all consider ourselves lucky. And, and it'll not be good. It'll not be excusable. It'll be a, a, a violation in every way uh, of our sovereignty. And just because people like to say spying is okay because we do it and they do it, uh, the scale and scope of this is not excusable and it was caught. Uh, but they still have the ability in networks in which they've, ma they've maintained some persistent control uh, to do the proverbial bomb drop if they really wanted to go that route. Uh, or more importantly, I think they could drop some leaflets by analogy. And uh, what they do to you know, conduct a misinformation or a disinformation campaign with control over sensitive networks uh, could play out for the, for the next coming years, not just the next couple of weeks. So framing this uh, as espionage exclusively is not complete and, and premature. And, uh, and I guess I'll end with this. Um, not Petya, a similar Russian in that case, uh, publicly attributed by, by authorities, the United States, uh, Great Britain, and others. Uh, it was a similar uh, supply chain attack, but it was coupled with a destructive set of code base that, that took the master boot record and, 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 and used uh, you know, our eternal blue tool here that we all talk about frequently and destroyed those machines. And so NotPetya remains the most costly cyber attack in history, uh, north of $10 billion dollars. Uh, uh, this attack remains the most uncertain ongoing attack in history. And so scale and scope uh, combined with what they do with that control is yet to be known. That's my best framing. Awesome. Thank you, Tom. And I do want to pull the thread on computer network exploit, computer network attack. I think that is often lost in some of the discussion. So uh, we'll definitely tee that up for the next round of uh questions. But but Michael, any any additional thoughts from your perspective? Obviously, each incident is unique. The tactics, techniques, and procedures are unique. But uh, but what, what are your thoughts uh, uh, in terms of what we know thus far? Well, I would certainly agree with Tom that, you know, this is still an ongoing, on, uh, you know, unfolding incident. And what I've been saying is, based on my experience with working previous incidents, we should expect the numbers to keep changing. We'll keep finding new new victims will find new places that uh, the adversary had gotten to. So there's going to be a lot more to come. Um, we are not nearly done with this thing. Um, I will say that, you know, like with a lot of incidents, though, what's interesting is I think we already have a lot of the technical picture has already started to emerge of how large chunks of this were done. Um, and that's usually not the hard part to unravel. Uh, the hard part is the uh, the damage assessment um, and sort of understanding the full scope and scale of who's been affected, uh, how has our national security potentially been impacted, how has our economic security been impacted, um, and that's going to be the work of, of months or even, as Tom said, into years. Um, so I would fully expect this to, you know, this incident is going to um, is going to keep playing out, um, and we're going to keep learning new aspects of it. Um, I do think it's important to also say that, um, you know, uh, we are starting to see other ways that this actor has potentially uh, gained access to networks. So just because you think you might have, you know, removed the Orion software from your network or something like that, do not become complacent. Uh, this is a very, very crafty adversary that uh, has contested us for control of networks in the past. Um, and I would expect that behavior to uh, to continue. So this is not something that I would uh, I would definitely become complacent about. In terms of how you compare it to other you know other incidents, I think again that's that's not yet. We don't we don't fully know that. Um, and so far, all the indications are that it has been espionage. But um, that's what we know so far. Um, and that is a point that I do think, Frank, that we should actually discuss further about, you know, the implications of that and the implications, as Tom said, of if it goes beyond that. Absolutely. That is that is question number two. And, and uh, as well as 
old techniques, but with new twists can still make for a really bad day. So I, I do want to pull, uh, pull that thread uh, uh, afterwards as well. Melissa, what are your, what are your opening thoughts on this? Well, I agree with everybody, what everybody said so far, but it's, it's sort of a tale of three companies currently that have transferred risk or there's great risk among either 18,000 or 300,000. Um, you know, so it really becomes with the, the, when I look at how FireEye has looked and, and disclosed what has happened, the loss of their tools, the loss of the, their tradecraft and how it could be used against other companies, and how outward and forward leaning they've been and transparent about th their bad day. Um, and then I think the second thing, when you look at the second company of uh, Solar Winds, um, has been less transparent about their bad day. And, um, and while they're working with customers, I, I don't actually see them taking the own, owning the responsibility of how much risk they brought to so many different enterprises. And then the third company I think that we need to talk about is Microsoft. And Microsoft is part of this problem because it was Microsoft Office 365 and Microsoft's cloud that has enabled really the kind of the launch point. And when you look at how many enterprises around the world use Microsoft, you see this huge risk transfer that's happening really among three companies, one for their tools and the forensics investigation, two because their software was really negligently managed, and then the third is the infrastructure that's deploying the architecture. So I believe that this is um, on scope and scale is significant and it, it's going to require us to change our conversation. And it's not about cybersecurity, this is about digital risk. And there's a persistent presence in every single one of these companies' networks. And they should assume, just as Michael and Tom said, that the adversary is there and the adversary is going to be persistent and your active directory is most likely poisoned. You're going to have people in your company that don't really exist in your company. And so there's going to be a persistent presence for a very long time until you can rebuild. And I think the final thing that I would make is that we have now should have and will have lost trust in all of these enterprises and all of these infrastructures, not just the government networks, but it's the corporate networks. And while the news has all been talking about IT companies and Fortune 50, Fortune 100, we cannot ignore the fact that this is also a protocol that can be used against the industrial control systems. And so we have a scale and scope of problems that we need to be looking at, not just corporate Fortune 500 publicly traded companies, but we have the key utilities of this country are also at risk. Thank you for that sobering perspective. And one of the things I do want to, to be able to, to build on is, I mean, historically, we've looked at 17 critical infrastructures that have been designated by the Department of Homeland Security and others. They're increasingly, if you think of that on the X axis, if you think on the Y axis, you've got critical functions, which in essence are single point failures, whether it's a assured PNT or whether it's cloud services or whether it's Microsoft 365. I mean, these are these are potential uh, uh, single point failures that I think we need to get our arms around. And I don't want to sound alarmist, but I do think that that has to be an important uh, element of our discussion. Chris, what are, what are your thoughts in terms of? I, I mean, you've been around a number of these, and uh, I, I'd be curious what your your initial uh, foray into this uh, would entail. Yeah, so I would say I would take, uh, give, I'd cut the Russians no slack in this. I will not take the eye off of the aggressor in this case, but I think it's equally important to turn that camera around and focus it on us to determine whether we're in the right place. The Russians clearly are in the wrong place, but are we in the right place? Um, and I would say that there are three questions that uh, come to mind. Um, what are we defending? We appear to be defending technology as opposed to the operations that are dependent upon that technology. We appear to be satisfied in trying to figure out how to defend operating systems or links or pathways or points of ingress or egress, when in fact we have to be defending the, the missions, the operations dependent upon that, if not the confidence that the society has in and on that. So we need to change that too. Uh, we, def we appear to be defending patches independent of one another, as opposed to combining our efforts and defending shared territory. Uh, this clearly is shared territory, which is under common attack. That's the particularly noteworthy um, kind of point of the Russian attack this time around, is that they essentially used an indiscriminate widespread method that holds everyone at risk, despite the fact that you could argue that what they were after was 
ministries that had a national security purpose. The, the third question for us is, is are we defending across the life cycle of the systems upon which operations are dependent, or do we kind of choose this detect and react strategy? We'll wait until the initiative has been seized by an adversary, in this case, the Russians, and then we'll say that we're going to be quick to the gap. We'll defend that gap. Um, that, that's a fool's errand. That can't be done. We have to defend the supply chain. We have to defend systems in operation. And we have to actually defend forward, right, not using um, too liberally the concept that U.S. Cyber Command has uh, pioneered. Um, the second point that I would make, aside from a focus on us, is that I think we have to be mindful that the world was on fire before this wind blew through. Um, kind of that pun taken aside, um, you know, we have looking over our shoulder, WannaCry, not Petya, the elections of 2016, 18, 20, ransomware, where nation states come after us, or criminal gangs that are tolerated or act actively abetted by nation states come after us. Um, to, the, to the point of whether this could be then the Pearl Harbor, um, I don't think so. Um, this may be notorious. It may be kind of focused um, kind of sufficiently sharply that it will hover in the mind's eye for quite some time. But I think we've been living in a slow, diffused Pearl Harbor for quite some time now. Um, imagine a Pearl Harbor where you don't kill 3,000 people in a single day or 911 where you don't do something similar, where you essentially diffuse that over time in space um, and you can kind of see someone disappear to the left or the right or some frailty be taken advantage of somewhere wide of you, but you think you're safe because that's separate from you. That's, that's not, not kind of affecting you. Um, this is common territory. This is operations. This is happening across the life cycle. And we need to join our resources and figure out what do we do to become a harder target, a more joined up target, um, and, and where in the international sphere, the Russians have to beat all of us to beat one of us. Thank you, Chris, and, 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 and I'm really glad you brought up some of those perspectives, because I think a lot of us think of Pearl Harbor as the analogy, when in reality, it's about erosion of trust and confidence, which can come in various uh, shapes, sizes, and forms, and something I think uh, uh, we all have to be on guard uh, uh, and think about. I, I want to pull the question that, Tom, you sort of teased up in your first answer. Maybe I'll start with Chris on this and then go to Tom and then everyone else jump in. But but the line, firstly, our words matter, whether it's attack, whether it's a uh, 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 war, whether it's a, a gray area, less than war. L let's talk through some of the implications there, because I think the line between exploit and attack is very thin. If you can get in the system and you pawn and own the system, uh, it's up to the adversary. The bad guy has a vote in terms of what uh, they can do next. So I'd be curious uh, what some of your thoughts are in terms of exploit, attack. Um, and then I'd also like to pull the thread a little further. What do you, do you think we're ever, you, we've, you guys have all been in these situations. Are we gonna find that smoking keyboard? And short of finding the smoking keyboard, what are the key indicators? What are the key clues we need to be thinking about to get that full picture? I, I wish it were as easy as the smoking gun, but uh, I, I'd be curious what, uh, Chris, maybe we'll start with you. Uh, the, you and I have had many discussions. The commission uh, uh, addressed this at great length. I, I'd be curious what some of your thoughts are. Then Tom, since uh, you jumped in, if you can weigh in on that, open it up to the others, uh, as well as, I mean, the dwell time here has been massive. It's been months. So it's pretty hard to know directly what the intent was. But I'd be curious what all of your thoughts are. So, Chris, you want to start us off? Yeah, I'll start. And, and I'm, um, I'm happy that the others can correct my math on this. But you've asked, I think, two distinct questions. Um, the first of those is what is Maybe three. <laughs> Across the set of actions that uh, we, we usually talk about, is this a physical attack? Clearly not. Um, is this a computer network attack? Maybe. Um, it's been described as such. Is this a computer network intelligence operation, computer network exploitation? Let me walk through each of those, um, and then I'll briefly touch on the second question you've asked um, you know, about attribution. Um, it, it's, this is clearly not a physical attack, as formally described under the law of armed conflict. conflict. Um, where you would directly hold health and life at risk. Um, but I'll come back to that. I'm not going to kind of you know let the witness out of the dock yet. Um, 
this is probably not kind of a classic computer network attack where you would deny, degrade, disrupt data systems or functions directly dependent on that. Now, this is more likely, at least intended to be, um, an intelligence operation of impressive scope and scale. But, but all three of those, as conducted by nation states, or for that matter, individuals, um, you know, if they're arguably going to be um, in, in the interest of the national security of the, of, the, of the aggressor, they have to actually exercise necessity and proportionality. You have to show due cause that you've undertaken these actions um, with sufficient care um, that you will affect only those things that are necessary for your national security and proportionate to that national security, and that you have reduced to a minimum the collateral effects. Um, in no way, shape, or form have, if this is the Russians, and I think we're going to find out ultimately that it is, in no way, shape, or form have they exercised any discretion that, that would say that they've met the standard of necessity and proportionality. So they've blown out right, of this possibility that this is simply an intelligence um, operation um, to where they're maybe not attacking directly the data, the systems, or the functions directly dependent on it, but they're clearly attacking the confidence that we as a society have in those systems, and very likely um, because of the indiscriminate nature of how they've applied this, opened weaknesses that then either nature or other aggressors, or possibly the Russians, could exacerbate ultimately in a computer network attack. Um, so I would say that it's, it's not a fair spectrum to say it's one of those three, it's actually a continuum, and they actually overlap one another. In this case, I would say that in scope and scale, clearly unacceptable. It is brazen, it is impactful, um, and it's indiscriminate. And in that regard, I would say that while the use of computer network attack or physical attack is not completely appropriate in this case, there's a consequence that is appropriate for whoever did this um, that, that is attendant to those two dimensions of the spectrum. Um, I'll just briefly mention the question of attribution. Um, in this case, this is so hard because we're comparing our notes and our shards and our hunches and our shreds of evidence after the fact, when in some cases the trail has gone cold, um, as opposed to understanding to a fairly well what the neighborhood looks like before the event, understanding who the usual suspects are before the event, belling the cat, so to speak, um, and comparing and contrasting our observations at the earliest possible moment, that opportunity has passed. We have to therefore think not so much about what we do more adroitly after an event like this, but what do we do before an event like this and during an event like this collectively? In an integrated, collaborative fashion. All right, you raised you raised a number of points where I'm going to want to pull on, including response, including defend forward, persistent engagement, and a handful of other issues. But before we do that, Tom, do you want to, since you raised it and eloquently gave a, a powerful analogy, I, I'd be curious what some of your thoughts are, and and also from a, a viewer's perspective, it, it is it's complex. And the reality is, is there's a lot of complexity that I'm not sure we're ever going to have 100% uh, insight on. But but I'd be curious what your thoughts are. You know, Chris just gave a master's course in complex. That's in why he teaches at the Naval Academy. No, and and it's extremely important. Uh, one of the, the things I've found more lately than than normal is how difficult it is to explain all of this to a broad audience. Um, you know, so in terms of framing, it almost strikes me that there's a lot of commonality with our COVID response because people are familiar with it. It's a, you know, a globally shared common problem. It's perfectly distributed. It requires institutional and individual contributions. Uh, it, it's lacking in early framing and leadership. It's plagued by intentionally misleading messaging. It's, it's conspiracy theory ridden. Uh, and both are hard to predict, uh, but significant, and they both have negative economic consequences. So let me see if I can unpack the f a few of what a few of the things that Chris just said. It, it, by and large, I agree with everything Chris just said in, in content, spirit and tone. Uh, there's one aspect that I would I would quibble with just for the sake of quibbling. It's, it's the same conclusion that our colleague Michael Schmidt reached in a, in a publication I read recently. Um, it's not that the conclusions are wrong, it's that they're premature. I continue to believe that even reaching a conclusion uh, on, 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 you know, juice at bellum as opposed to juice in bellow, right, on whether this constitutes something that we could consider sufficient to, to uh, you know, put it into the category of self-defense and, and justify the use of force and retaliation. You know, does this predicate war? Probably not, uh, but it's premature. 
and, and that's, that's the distinction between Chris and I. With the access they have, I, I contend the following. I contend that uh, the SVR operators that we believe are behind this will be attributed. They're, they're, the question is to whether there's a smoking keyboard or not. We'll see how that plays out. But what, what I've learned to date, um, there's a lot uh, of, of context clues that at very least allow us to conclude uh, that this was a campaign orchestrated by one entity that has a significant amount of time and resources. And, uh, and I think we'll be able to exclude some other suspects like China, which has been introduced into this discussion. Uh, from what I've learned from the people at SolarWinds and at, at, at FireEye, uh, I think that there'll be some confidence in what we end up concluding. In that vein, if it is them and what we know about their tradecraft, uh, I, I believe any targeted customer, and this is, I think, a point that all of us have made here, has to presume that the, that the hackers would have long ago abandoned any of the infrastructure or static indicators associated with the solar winds Orion entry point. And they would have moved laterally in ways that are not so easily discoverable and removable by just taking Orion out of your networks. I'd also note, by the way, that it took us over a year to remove Kaspersky Lab software uh, from our federal networks, and we're still trying. So it's not always even as easy to just remove software from networks that are large and, and, and distributed. Uh, but now you've, you've got a couple of, I think, interesting uh, points on the table that Chris added. He's saying it's not yet a justification to go to war, yet I contend they're holding us at risk. So it's not a perfect analogy that they've planted bombs all over the country that they haven't yet detonated. Uh, but there's a concept here of being held at risk that I, I can't abide. And I think it, it, it justifies a number of actions, both unilateral and hopefully multilateral, to galvanize a global response. And that response need not start with missiles and death. Uh, I wouldn't counsel that. It doesn't mean I would rule out a predicate. Uh, I, would, I, would, um, I would remain, I think, a little bit uh, neutral on that question for right now because uh, with the access I believe they maintain, persistent access they maintain, their uh, fickle motives may change over time. And I think that whether this started as espionage or not, it's not as important as what they've now caught by the toe. So then what Chris does, I think rightly, is apply the second category of the law of war, in this case, the juice and bellow. What may you do when you are using a cyber tool as a weapon? And I agree with them wholeheartedly that we need to insist on rules governing discrimination and proportionality in the use of cyber tools. That was the mistake made in the NotPetya case. Uh, that particular tool was used as a weapon in, the, in an ongoing conflict, an annexation of a sovereign nation's territory. Uh, at that point, it was, I think we were plus 10,000 deaths in that military conflict. So the tool was used as a weapon in a, in a campaign. The question is, was it used appropriately? And the answer is no. It was designed by its developers to knowingly spread without control, propagate around the globe, and do as much damage as possible. That's the design feature of that particular tool. And as a result, uh, they, they violated the, the, the fundamental rules, as, uh, as, as my friend General McMaster says, established by Sir Thomas Aquinas uh, of discrimina discrimination and proportionality. So if we can't all agree that this is or is not a predicate to war uh, or to the use of force, which I think is, is, is wise, but not necessarily conclusive yet. We can at least all agree that if you do use a weapon of this nature in furtherance of your national security interests, that you have to do it with discrimination and proportionality. And I'll, I'll kind of close that thinking this way. We bend over backwards, applying the rules and laws of, of the past to these kind of uh, new technologies. And I think there's wisdom in that, but there's also a need to develop new doctrine. And, and, and let's kind of get past all of the treaty obligation requirements that cause us to argue and develop a solution, hopefully one that galvanizes all free internet loving Western worlds uh, and, and that we can use those galvanized agreements to bring other pressures to bear. Instead of shooting missiles, we could probably uh, embargo some oil right now and make Putin feel pretty uncomfortable. What, a, what, a, what an insightful set of commentary from both Chris and Tom. I, I think that frames this, uh, this issue in a very productive and helpful way. And I do want to sort of jump into 
we're never going to get a hundred percent necessarily, but, uh, but what the clues are, what the indicators are. And, and, and I, I think I, I'm going to ask everyone agrees that we can't blame the victim here, that, that, that there needs to be a response commensurate to the potential, uh, um, uh, outcome in this particular event. But I, I'd be curious what, uh, everyone's thoughts are on that. But before getting to that, Melissa, Michael, anything you want to add on that? I, I, I think that we got a master's course, uh, like uh, Tom said, in a, in a short amount of time. But, but this is a complex issue. You've been there yeah. before. We're never going to get 100%. So I'd be curious what your thoughts are. Well, I mean, I think that I, 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 think that I am probably uh, a little more restrained uh, than Tom and Chris in how I think about this, um, because it does appear to be espionage. Up until this point. Now, I agree that it, I am very much of the view that I, I keep saying so far, right, which is which is my way of agreeing with Tom and Chris that like there's way too much access here. It's way too early. And I would be reserving our right to uh, respond if we find activities uh, that have crossed the line or if the Russians do cross um, the line. Um, and I do think that it is right to be pushing on the parts of this that appear to be indiscriminate and disproportionate. Um, I would be very careful, though, in my escalation path, because, you know, um, in particular, when you look at how much of the rest of the world views us, um, they don't see us very differently. You know, right now, I mean, if you look at if you draw another distinction, Right. Like the Europeans are sitting there going, ah, China, U.S. tech companies, eh. you know, um, sort of the same thing. They're both sort of evil governments that are trying to, you know, impinge on us. Right. And so we've got to be mindful of the fact that the rest of the world does not necessarily see us as the good guys. And so anything that we have done that would be perceived as similar um, would be used against us and undermine our ability to. Uh, get that international coalition that we would want. So that's why I think it's very important for us to focus on the pieces of this that are different than and disproportionate and out of bounds of the ways that we ourselves would conduct um, intelligence operations. And so that's why, um, you know, my my thinking is that we need to be very um, we need to be very judicious in how we in how we escalate this. Um, and how we do our uh, and how we do our response. Notice, I don't say if we do a response. How we do a response, um, I think, is very uh, is very important. Well, you teed up a great question. I'm going to ask all of you in a second, but before I do that, Melissa, um, any any additional insights on that? I, I'm glad, Michael, that you gave a differing uh, differing perspective on that and. Uh, these are the discussions you'll, you'd be having right now inside the executive office of the presidency and, and, and so many others. But, but Melissa, I'd be curious what your thoughts are on this. I, I think I agree with what everybody has said. And, um, I, and I, just to build on what Michael said, is we're not the only country in, um, that had corporations or in institutions affected. The United Kingdom, Canada, Belgium, Netherlands. And so there are a lot of our allies that are affected as well. So we can't take an independent path um, of we need to really, for the first time maybe in a while, take an alliance strategy um, and uh, of how we would are going to look at this. We all have supply chain vulnerabilities that could be and will be exploited. So I, I absolutely agree with Michael. I also think this is going to be we have to be very deliberative because in this very delicate time of transition between the presidents, um, you don't want to trap the next administration in um, into a path that they, you know, that maybe narrows the point of view or where they need to go. Um, I think second, we need to do a much, I think, a, an important analysis of how many of the Section Nine companies were affected and how much economic. Um, you know, areas are at risk right now. Section nine is the top X, you know, um, number of companies that represent a significant portion of our GDP or health infrastructure. Um, and, you know, I think that what is really interesting to me is this has stolen a headline um, right now. And we have another emergency underway that can't be overlooked that has is that we have a number of our hospitals, health institutions, 
and the infrastructure for the distribution of the vaccines that are all being ransomed, some of which are proxy agents that are of the Russian government and some are uh, criminal gangs and other things. And that is also an immediate requirement of our operational focus. And so you could almost look at this as this is a beautiful distraction from the immediate crisis and, you know, and, an, and a secondary crisis at hand. And, and without a lot of um, the institutions prepared to deal with multiple crises at the same time. And so, and I think that's important. So I, I don't, I don't, we don't want to limit our options and you certainly don't want to limit the options of the next president. Yeah, so I want to pull that thread. I, I assume, and, and let me ask before I assume, um, everyone here agrees that it demands a response. What that response can take different, uh, different shapes and sizes, but I think it's fair to say we can't simply blame the victim. We can't simply defend our way out of this problem. We can't simply firewall our way out of this problem. It's obviously much more complicated than that. But to induce changes in behavior, there has to be consequences for bad behavior. Does, does everyone agree with that? Does anyone disagree with that? I'm hearing uh, everyone more or less uh, uh, agrees with that, which is a good thing. Uh, to take uh, that as a context, Frank, please. Frank, I was quiet yeah. there, but I'll just for the sake of being provocative, because Michael Good. and Melissa know I like them both. Um, how can you both agree uh, with that statement and maintain the belief that this is not only espionage only, but that it's not even as urgent as the the obvious you know, future that you've painted? If you've got ongoing ransomware attacks and things of a... Of, of a less sophisticated nature being played out, it doesn't take too much of a logical leap to conclude that the, that the access, root level access that the, that the perpetrators of this particular hack maintain today will be used tomorrow to achieve that and, and potentially worse. So, so I, I'm curious as to how we can maintain it's a, um, a view that it's, that it's kind of an indistinguishable act of espionage and a view that it requires as a response. And I'm not being rude about that. I'm trying to figure out how to reconcile those two things. Because I, I think, okay. importantly, there's a debate inside our U.S. government right now, and, and there are a number of people saying, let's not really react that much to this thing because it might just be espionage and let's play it, let's let it play out. I, I think well, that's I mean, dangerous. Melissa, please. Then Michael, go ahead. I think that's dangerous because you, when you have this much of a persistent access, um, you have the you have leverage, and you have the ability to maintain use that access to deliver a wiper or um, you know some other whatever it is that you want. I mean, not, uh, you know, when you mentioned it earlier. I think Thomas, you know, the not Petcha. This is just like the Doc Me, but it also has a similar kind of feel as what we had for Buckshot Yankee back in two thousand seven and eight. Um, and so you can start to look at the penetration of the classified networks and then, you know, and, and back then, and then the doc ME with the wiper virus that hit like so many corporations. And I would argue it was in hundreds of billions of dollars in economic damage when you start to think about how many corporations were affected and how it really destroyed their capital equipment um, across so many different infrastructures from Merck Pharmaceuticals to Maersk Shipping to Federal Express, et cetera. I mean, there were so many companies around the world that were affected by it. So if you look at this as being something akin to not Petya, as far as penetration or affected companies, but with a persistent access um, of being able to, whether it's exfiltrate data um, or be able to sabotage or, you know, denial of service, whatever it is, is the infrastructure that, yes, it's something that warrants a response. But I, I would argue that the response has to be, again, proportional or measured, but it also has to be thought through of we're in a very delicate time of transition between two presidents. And so it really requires, in my opinion, it would require working with the current administration and the future administration so that there's a coordinated response of how we're going to handle it, because this is going to be a, a very long response process. It's not a let's just have a, a meeting in the Oval Office or a meeting in the sit room and we're going to decide and it's going to be, you know, whatever that is, an oil sanction. So it's going to have to be long and measured because it's going to take a very long time to get to get this all of this penetration, persistent presence out of our core infrastructures and networks. 
Michael, so anything you want to add to that? Agree. Yeah, and, and I would. So, go ahead. Sorry. Chris. Yeah, I mean, what I was going to say is that even you know, even if you go back to the Cold War, right, and you look at how we handled revelations of uh, espionage activities in the Cold War, um, they still often demanded a response, right? Um, and the and so in this case, you can start to imagine, you know, putting together a package of stair steps that you can that you can walk up. And to Melissa's point, you can start laying the foundation for that. Um, you know, you can start with the, the messaging portion, like, you know, actually using, for example, the hotline that we established with Moscow to, um, you know, express our concerns in this and to lay it out clearly. We know it was you <laughs> and, you know, we want you to stop this behavior. And there are going to be consequences if you cross these lines, right? You can start laying the predicate for what you want to what you want to do. You can begin to take action again in the diplomatic sphere, both to build an alliance and to, you know, uh, send some Russian diplomats and their spies home, um, you know, back, uh, you know, out of the country, you know, things like that. So there are there are options that you can do to step this up. Until we actually understand um, what we're, uh, until we have a better understanding of what we're dealing with, and that also gives us multiple paths um, and multiple choices to uh, to to select from. And because I also think that's very important, as Melissa points out, to you know we're doing during doing this during a time of transition is quite uh, is it, it would be challenging under any circumstances. It is going to be particularly you know challenging right now given this particular transition. Uh, so Chris, do you want to build Chris, on this? I and then I would say, if I could briefly, I, I don't think that we disagree. I think that we're actually converging into the same place. Um, we can all agree that uh, this is not something for which we want to induce greater chaos with a short term response to what might be perceived as a literal attack. But that being said, society has a long history of saying we don't need to wait for the crash to sanction the reckless driver, or in this case, possibly a drunk driver, take him off the road, apply a consequence to essentially make sure that this action is channeled and, and reserved, right, for legitimate activities within society. I do agree strongly with uh, Melissa, and I think by extension, Michael, that, that we need a campaign that will transcend the current administration into a future administration and do that campaign in the largest possible venue all instruments of society across multiple societies. There are like-minded nations out there that are in the same place. We need to make sure that we are aligned with them and applying these instruments of power alongside them. So, so I want to use this and I want to make sure we allow uh, questions from the audience. And, and let me just underscore, if you do have a question you'd like to ask of the panel, please use the comment section on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter. We'll try to uh, siphon those off and get those forward. But before I do that, um, I, I think you guys uh, brought us to what should we, this transition, and this is a window of vulnerability, and it always is between presidential uh, transitions, but what does this mean for priorities for the incoming administration in terms of cyber? I, I'm going to start with you, Chris, and, and Tom, maybe, Tom, you know what, I'll start with you. What does this mean? I'm a big proponent of uh, forward engagement, uh, forward uh, 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 persistent engagement and forward deployment. This doesn't mean scrap that, does it? I, I'd be curious what some of your thoughts are uh, in terms of going forward, and then I want to make sure everyone has an opportunity to touch on that before we turn it over to audience questions. So, Tom, why don't you kick us off on that? Uh, well, let's see. So, you know, maybe Chris just framed it the right way. I would take uh, two of Chris's statements made so far today and stitch them together. Uh, the first is that we need a, a, a doctrine, uh, an approach that, uh, that brings all of our elements of national power to bear and is not artificially confined to you know, cyber and cyber technologies and, and defensive patching, uh, but a holistic approach using all of our capabilities and authorities. And then I would uh, weave in uh, a nod to Melissa here. Of course, uh, in my view, it should be in a multilateral way uh, implemented and executed. I do though, however, believe that uh, there's a little bit of paralysis in developing a new doctrine in a multilateral fashion. So the U.S. has an opportunity, I believe, to lead, not to the exclusion of our allies, uh, but but really um, uh, to their benefit. Uh, often 
situations like this, unfortunate as they may be, provide us an opportunity. I've now in the past gotten in trouble for saying to play some jazz music. Uh, we all understand the, the the principles. We've got a lot of experience here. We can improvise a little bit despite not having reached a multilateral agreement in the UN that might take a long time. Uh, and, and, and I think uh, as a result, galvanize um, uh, some support. I believe we do already have a fractured internet, fractured along, along the lines of political organizational structures and geographic lines. Uh, and I think that there's some benefit to exploiting that and not letting it just engulf us. So the notion of, of having people sign up with our points of view, uh, I think will lead to a, um, a Westphalian Occident uh, that all believes in a common set of acceptable rules on the Internet akin to the drunk driving analysis. And the second component here uh, that I'd like to introduce from Chris's previous statement is the notion that we view this as supporting operations and not as uh, supporting technology for the sake of itself. I've heard him say that now a number of times. I, I completely align with that thinking. And it, it'll, it'll, I think, breathe urgency into this debate and take it out of the complicated world of ones and zeros. Uh, I think with those two things, uh, you know, the particular questions here, of course, we need a campaign. We need a response over time. Um, I've been quite public about saying that we ought to be careful about the sequencing of our response until we decide how much our, quote, pants are down. Uh, the network control and integrity question of being held at risk is, is so upsetting for that very reason. If we were to do something tomorrow that would be viewed as war, you know, commonly to Chris's phrasing, uh, I think the Russians enjoying control could use that. Uh, to justify any escalatory uh, reprisal. So, uh, okay, the, the last part of this is I, I do think you all of us have raised the question of sovereignty. And uh, the British, I think, have suggested there is no real uh, sovereignty online. Um, other countries have remained neutral. Uh, the United States has remained neutral. I think we should weigh in. Uh, I am, uh, um, I am a, perhaps if there's a difference between Melissa and, and Michael and I, it might be to hew a little bit towards our unilateral right to act. I'm not always looking to act in a bilateral way that excludes others. Uh, but when, when, our, when our national security is threatened, uh, and in this case it is, I don't exclude the threat to the other countries and, and companies affected. I think that we can, um, uh, we can have a healthy debate with our allies, but if they don't agree, we should, we should roll out. I think they'll end up following. And I think there's a, a need for leadership here. So the Biden team, um, in the last three presidencies under each of us, we've all ultimately, for various reasons, not all specific and policy related, some of them practical and you know uncertainty and instability around us and so forth, left a cyber strategy that says we need to answer the question of who has what role and responsibility uh, among and between government and private industry, but we've never actually answered it. And I think the Biden team has an opportunity to answer some of those questions. Awesome. And, and, and I don't mean to be pejorative here, but uh, um, why don't we have these campaign plans and playbooks in place? I, we let the adversary shape our response rather than us being more proactive. So I'd be curious what all your thoughts are on that, because and it's really not meant to be pejorative, because I, I understand the complexity that uh, uh, each each incident is unique. But we've got to be at the point where we drive in our best interests and not let the adversary shape our response because that hamstrings that narrows our ultimate uh, aor so I'd, I'd be curious what you all think on that and i know chris you and i this i hope you touch on a little bit some of the solarium findings on that so and then i want to ask all of you where the diplomatic piece where state department should come in and and again i'm biased here but Solarium, one of our big findings that didn't get acted upon is elevating the, uh, uh, the cyber diplomacy mission to, uh, to an undersecretary kind of level and, and, and all that comes with that. But Chris, you want to jump? I, I'm, I'm, I'm leading well, the witness here, question, but uh, take us um, home. Which is, why are we in this box? I, I would say a combination of two human um, flaws. Uh, the first being hubris, um, where, where we think we're clever enough to essentially just Kind of react well, we'll detect a threat to us um, in real time and we'll respond and we'll overwhelm it. Um, that, that simply can't be done given the scope, scale, the nature of how cyberspace actually works. 
Um, and the second is the tyranny of what I would describe division of effort. Divisions of effort, which are very well defined, um, are actually an agreement to not collaborate. You defend your patch, I'll defend my patch, as if those are independent territories and the tools that are possessed inside of either one of those are sufficient to the defense of any of those. That's, that's, cl that's clearly not the case. Um, and so if I could just go briefly into Solarium without giving kind of the grassroots tutorial on it, what, what Solarium decided at the end of the day was the strategy that's lacking is not the definition of any particular piece or part or authority, it's the combination of those is that if we combined our authorities and capabilities in the largest possible venue, we could in fact challenge adversaries who routinely crowdsource us. We could make it such they need to beat all of us to beat one of us. They need to be applied concurrently. Um, they need to be done using integration and collaboration as opposed to simple division of effort. And we do need to align actions and consequences, both positive and negative. The tool sets inside of that are technology, authority, human capacity, and will, willpower. And those four things aren't often naturally aligned. Therefore, you need some life forces to be brought to bear. There's a national cyber director on the table for this nation. There are three former cyber directors on this presentation. They all added value in their day. We haven't had one for at least two years, and we now see the consequences of the lack of a joined up kind of federal enterprise. We need an assistant secretary of state to make that an international kind of cap capability. We need CISA to stand up, stand in, but to be the connective tissue as opposed to the, the next champion. And we need sector specific agencies. We need to improve resilience. We need to improve active defense through collaboration. And we need to impose whole of society consequences. If we do all of those using all authorities, all capabilities concurrently integrating and collaborating in the largest possible venue, I would suffer, right, you know, the, the kind of the next ravage of the Russian because I think that it will be game game over. You know, we will not commit a next owned goal. Frank? Awesome. That, that, it's, so thank you for bringing that up. And, and, and the concept of shaping rather than reacting. That allows us to get in front of this. And and I'm glad you brought up the National Cyber Director. And, and, and Tom, I, before I turn to, to Melissa and Michael, you wouldn't disagree that 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 position is critical, yes? Rob Joyce I would not disagree. Uh, I, would not disagree. Um, I have said over and over uh, that ideally the person in that position that can bring together all these independent contributors and organizations into one unified um, objective and and then with that unified objective coordinate a unified effort uh, should enjoy awesome. uh, three should have three kind of qualities access regular access to the president. Uh, the authority to convene and coordinate all the cabinet members because each of them possess some component part. And then um, uh, lastly, experience. I think that, that that's sometimes uh, assumed in our debate, uh, but, but we really need all three. Melissa, Michael, I want you to zero in very quickly on the diplomat. I have a bunch of questions that have come in and the tyranny of time requires I be a bit of a tyrant, but we can't let the diplomatic uh, question go unanswered. Uh, Melissa, Michael, anything you want to add to to that element? Well, I, I mean, I Melissa. think that it's really, I think uh, it's really important. The diplomatic, uh, we have to rebuild alliances that have um, and build the trust of our closest allies and then our extended allies that have uh, diminished over the last, uh, at least the last four years plus. Um, and we have to actually, I think, marry um, our tech policy and where we're going with tech policy along with our digital resilience strategy. And they're intertwined and, um, and they need to be up leveled and we need to set a vision that's a decade long vision, not a, a term limit, uh, you know, two years, four years, uh, you know, et cetera. And, and that has to, I kind of, I look at it as, we're playing a game of risk, but we forgot that it's a global map. And we're playing uh, overlaid with the settlers of Catania, Catan, with the supply lines. And that if you play both games at the same time, that's how we need to think about the next 10 years. And we need a diplomatic strategy that will enable that. Michael, do you have yeah, one I, word? And, and one thing I just yeah. want to underscore, and I think, uh, uh, Tom, you deserve a lot of credit for this uh, as well, is we finally have some combined attribution around events. And I know that's not easy. I mean, talk about sources and methods on steroids here, but we, we did make a step in the right direction with some of this five eyes attribution and some of our transatlantic uh, at, 
but it's it's not where it it's not fully where we want it to be. But but Michael, sorry, I, I just needed to yeah. to give props where they're due because I would have never thought we would have done that five years ago. So I was happy to see that. Yeah, and I think the other thing just to um, kind of then weave together what Melissa was saying, which is that this is not a cyber espionage problem, just to take this incident. This is a Russian action problem, right? In other words, you cannot separate the incident from the the perpetrator and our geopolitical relationship with that perpetrator. Um, similarly, just as our relate, and so to build on what Melissa was saying, we really have to come at this from not just looking at it for Ru Russia through a cyber lens, but what's our broader relationship with Russia? Same thing with China, same thing with Iraq, same thing with these criminal actors. We can't be just looking yep. at it yep. as, uh, as a cyber problem. This is really part of our broader geopolitical situation. And that's why State Department is so critical because you have to build in and take into account your relationship, that multi- you know, I'll, I'll throw in three-dimensional chess on top of Melissa's uh, risk and feathers of Catan because we're actually playing this in multiple dimensions at the at the same time. And, and I'm happy you brought that up, Michael, because our deterrence strategy, it, it, you don't deter cyber. You deter Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, and, and, and what dissuades, deters, or compels each actor is going to be different. What works in the Russian context may not in the Chinese context. What works in the, the Communist Party uh, of China's context may not work in Iran and on the list goes. So I'm glad you brought that up. I want to make sure I get a couple of questions. I'm, I'm going to start with just because he's uh, the newest member of our team, Mark Sachs, who's uh, now our uh, uh, is deputy director of the McCrary Institute focused on training and, and, and research. But his question is, uh, should the most critical software companies be added to the Section 9 list? And it sort of gets to the critical function question. And I'd be curious uh, what you all think with that. And it, it follows up on um, another question we received from Andrew Goldsmith, is whether or not the federal government needs to impose tougher standards on software companies to protect uh, from these attacks. These are not new to this particular situation, but I think that there are important questions. I'd be curious what uh, what you all think on that one, on those two questions. I'll, I'll, I'll start. Um, tougher standards on the software companies, absolutely. Uh, if, you know, to have solar winds one, two, three on the development software and on the enterprise was is irresponsible, if not negligent. And, you know, and, and that we, sh we have to hold all of the software companies to a higher standard. And, you know, we have the standards published. We hold defense contractors and others to those standards. So absolutely. And they shouldn't actually be allowed to be the core of, our, of some of these government agencies without having gone through some due diligence on the software. Second, I do think as we become more dependent upon um, uh, AWS, uh, Microsoft Azure, the cloud platforms, and you look at how many outages we've had in the platforms ranging from two to 12 hours in the last even just two months, that we're going to have to look at those as critical infrastructure providers, because when they go down, we all go down. Um, and, uh, and therefore, we're going to have to think more broadly. And you're already seeing Europe think about this as, those, as the cloud providers are already in the network information security directive of being held to a higher standard. Uh, Frank, I don't, big I don't there you, that, please. Yeah, I, I don't see how you escape like naming the um, the, for example, the cloud providers that Melissa was just talking about. They are as critical as any electric utility or water utility now uh, to the way our society functions. Um, so I don't see how you now. That doesn't mean you need you need to leap on them with like you know uh, 18 pounds of regulation. But I do think that it starts to say that there is a public interest in how those entities operate their services. And that means there needs to be a broader discussion between the government and those entities about, you know, how we're going to manage that from a public sector point of view, because there is, in addition to their private interest, there is also a public interest, uh, in those activities. So there could be some lessons in the EU standards as well, not to overburden on the regulatory side as well, as well as acknowledging what the unique vulnerabilities are. Fair? Yes. <laughs> I don't want to put words in your mouth, but. 
that there's an additive piece here that the Solarium Commission worked its way through, which is that oftentimes these pieces are sufficiently small and discreet that, that they don't yet represent something that is either directly of security consequence or it's not delivered by the vendor into the hands of the ultimate consumer. And so we came up with a concept of final goods assemblers to say that at that point, when you combine multiple capabilities, hardware, software, firmware, maybe some overlay of doctrinal use, when you do all of that, you're also responsible for the security that then results or does not and the sustainment of such. We do that with car manufacturers. Um, if some airbag goes bad down, line, down the line in your car, it's the manufacturer that ultimately is going to find the end consumer and make that bring that back into sufficient resilience and robustness. So we need to think about where market forces can combine some of these threads in our supply chain um, into something that then creates not simply a primary function for the customer, but, but as a byproduct of that, the resilience and robustness the customer has grown to expect. Awesome. Tom, yeah. did you want no, to add to that? Knowledge, knowledge is needed here in all of those answers um, to make them all work. And, and here's what I mean. Uh, in my experience, regulating safety is something that's achievable. Uh, regulating security is not. It, it can be uh, it can be additive, but not fully achieved. So the nuclear Navy has a tremendous record. Uh, their regulations and their enforcement of those regulations have led to putting human beings underwater in nuclear reactors floating alongside them and, and no major accidents. Uh, but they don't, therefore, then guarantee that the bad guy won't shoot them out of the water. Uh, they just guarantee that they won't have a safety problem. And so um, I'm not as uh, I'm not quite there on, on all the regulatory uh, rhetoric, um, and, and I'm not entirely certain yet how if I'm going to kind of reach a conclusion on solar winds until I learn more. I did see that piece though on the on the one password, but it seems to me that the tradecraft involved in getting uh, code into this Orion uh, code update would have required potentially a year of work uh, to get that past those code developers to not only not see it, but also to not throw off its functionality when they when they soaked it and then and then deployed it. So uh, here here's how here's what I would say. S section nine, the spirit of that question, the answer is yes. Uh, but I'd like to see a, a more comprehensive partnership between government and private industry in terms of sharing context and not just uh, static indicators after the fact, in real time, that relationship needs to mature considerably. And so if Spirit 9 captures the spirit of it, or Section 9 captures the spirit of it, then fine. But I think something far broader is necessary. Guys, I, I failed in my one job, and that's to, to make sure we end on time. But I want to ask one more question and, and very quick responses. And this is from uh, Gopal Ratnam with Congressional Quarterly is asking, uh, why why do, we, do you all think it took so long for this to be detected? Uh, and why did it take a private sector entity to uh, ring the bell? Anyone have some parting thoughts on that? Well, in part, if you consider the larger landscape, you know, is, is shared territory and everyone has their own soda straw looking at it, possibly because those soda straws have not been connected. I don't think we know yet who found it first. We know who kind of at this moment in time seemed to have found it first, but it may well be there's a telltale out there that somebody was noodling their way through that if that had been combined in something approaching real time um, with someone else's kind of observation would have fired this synapse far, far sooner. There's this old adage of we need to connect the dots. I don't think that's the case here. We need to actually gather our resources to form dots that none of us can form alone. Anyone else yeah. want to build on that? And I think we should not underestimate the tradecraft of this adversary. I mean, they, they went low, they went slow, they were deliberate. Uh, as Tom said, that this was not something they like woke up one Saturday morning, you know, uh, and said, let's do this. You know, I mean, it was. Do you know it wasn't on a Saturday, Michael? <laughs> yeah, you're right. <laughs> you know, I mean, this was, this was the result. Was it on a day? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is the result of, a, of, a, of an incredibly long, well thought out, well resourced, well planned, well executed campaign. Um, and so, in fact, actually, I've raised the question of, you know, did they really hope that they would have this access for years? And in fact, had it blown in nine months? And so, that from their standpoint, this actually has been a big failure. Um, we actually don't know. Um, 
the, the answer to that question. Because, I mean, this is a, such a complex uh, operation. We, we should really not underestimate the, the, the wildness and the tradecraft of our adversary in this, in this area. Michael, I agree. If it's, an influence op, if it's an influence op, they may have succeeded beyond their wildest dreams. <laughs> Fair enough, right. yes. But, but I think it's also, Last I agree word, with Melissa. all of that. I agree with all of that, but don't underestimate also the timing of the launch of the software update was when we all moved to work from home. Exceptions were made in every enterprise, including the United States government. And I would say that our architectures are a house of cards that at this point has been exploited in one card and multiple cards are being removed. It's a question of whether or not we can rebuild fast enough or whether they're all gonna come tumbling down. I cannot, uh, perfectly said, and, and I'm glad we also ended on the resilience theme because at the end of the day, no matter what, we've got to ensure that we build resilient systems and, and bounce forward. Um, one thing that no one brought up that I just want to touch on is We've got other means of intelligence that can uh, provide perspective and insight onto the perpetrator, their intentions and their modalities. And I hope that that question is no longer a question. It is a priority for our other uh, communities to, to, to make that uh, uh, rule number one. But I couldn't have asked for a better group. I, I Please join me uh, virtually um, uh, to, to thank uh, an amazing group here uh, you more than delivered on shedding more light than heat on, a, on an important set of topics. And, and uh, dare I say, all of us are, are really fortunate that, that, that you were in the driver's seats uh, in, in three different administrations. Uh, let's hope that these issues are prioritized in the incoming administration. Uh, and without further ado, thank you. Thank you uh, uh, so much for, for joining us today and, and look forward to continuing this conversation. Thank you. Thank you.